That's what it's supposed to do? Yeah. Okay. Before we all explode? <laughs> okay, so, hi there. Um, so, we're Jen and Jared. I'm the Jared, she's the Jen. Um, and we have, we both work at a company called Lullabot. We've worked together for a number of years now, actually. Um, we're both designers. We both have a design background. Our training is design, so if you are somehow in this session thinking we are going to dive into vagaries of Drupal core initiatives or uh, things like technical theming things in Drupal, you can, no shame at all in like getting up and finding a different session. And we're gonna be covering the design process behind uh, this new core initiative, the Olivero theme. Um, as I said, we both work for Lullabot. I joined Lullabot about 10 years ago now, in April of 2010. And at the time that I joined, I remember meeting uh, Jen Simmons, who she was about a month into a process on a project called Bartik at that time. Um, and I remember being fascinated with it, uh, hung out with her at, I think it was DrupalCon San Francisco maybe, and was talking to her about it. Um, I didn't end up ever getting involved in that, but it's pretty fascinating actually that this project in this theme was like the default theme for Drupal for a decade now, as of this coming April, I think, or I think it rolled out in June. Uh, so this year we'll hit a decade of Bartik. Um, anybody here actually work on Bartik at some point? Uh, yay! You guys laid the foundation that somehow lasted the Drupal community for 10 years. Um, and how many of you have used Bartik at some, at some point? Okay. Um, great. Um, <laughs> speaking of laying foundations, I also want to note that so the like the origins or the germ of this project started with my colleagues Putra and Mike, Putra Bonacorsi, Mike Herschel, Mike is right there, Putra will be here tomorrow I think. Yeah. Um, they were hanging out uh, at DrupalCon Seattle, I think they were in the lobby of the hotel talking with each other about what would constitute a great CMS theme kind of out of the box and I think Angie Byron and Lowry Escala, if I'm saying that right, came in and it turned into this conversation that left Putra and Mike fascinated with the fact that there was no plans for any new theme within uh, Drupal 9. Uh, so they started to getting to work on just kind of thinking that through. Dries also in his keynote at DrupalCon Seattle mentioned that uh, while Drupal was still beloved by many experts, uh, beginners didn't think it was that great and often the reasons that they talked about were that out of the box it looked like something that was a decade old. So. Putra and Mike established just kind of a few goals for, for themselves. They're like, if we actually take on trying to make something, what do we want to do? What do we want to accomplish? And they came up with, they wanted a new modern design. They wanted something, a theme that f could feel current enough, at least for the next five years-ish, you know, because it probably isn't going to get redone again a year from now, as Bartik proved to us. Um, they wanted to support some of the new things that Drupal can do now that it could not do when Bartik was made. Uh, and they wanted to meet the more stringent uh, accessibility requirements that Drupal now has. Um, so that's like it in a nutshell, the, the origin story. Putra actually just published an article on lullabot.com that kind of goes into the how did they turn this into a core initiative thing. So if you're interested in that, I recommend checking that out, bit.ly slash Olivero D9. Um, so that's when uh, that's where we come in um, it was at that point that I think either Mike or Putra or both reached out to Jen and then in a conversation Jen and I had I found out about it and somehow we got roped into like well it's, we need some designers if we're going to do this uh, so this talk what we're going to do here is we're going to try to answer a few questions for you who are we? Uh, why did we do this? Um, how did we do this? and what would you say you did here? Um, and right now we're at the you are here point kind of in between, so the good news is this is gonna move along quickly. Uh, and hopefully if we have time, we'll leave some space for questions at the end. So first, why did we do this? Like the challenges of designing a CMS theme um, are interesting. Like uh, Jen and I have worked together for a long time and this was unlike most of the projects that we do for client work. 
So there is a degree to which, even though we're up here speaking to you about this, as though we know we came into this project not knowing how you do this, like how you do uh, a design process where you don't actually get to talk to member representative members of the entire audience or every segment, where you don't exactly know going in who the, who the stakeholders are. Um, they're the fundamental uh, questions of any kind of design project. And when you're designing something like this, uh, it can be really tricky to answer these. Um, so how you solve for the, that also can create its own challenges. Um, there are two kind of p potentially alluring approaches, I think, to solving for that, that both have big pitfalls. So I wanted to just mention those because they came out right at the beginning. The first is just you design in such a way that you include everything for anyone, thereby making it unwieldy and unusable for everyone. And so this was something that we were constantly kind of thinking about and looking at and how, how do we avoid doing that. The other problem though, the second problematic approach is that you design for the average and that you wind up designing for no one because no one person is the average. To understand this, this particular flaw, it's interesting to look back to the 1830s. There was a Belgian astronomer, his name was Adolf Cotelet, uh, and astronomers back then whether you realize it or not, like there wasn't good ways to measure the night sky. And so they were doing things like taking t tons and tons and tons of measurements and then doing uh, astronomical mapping by averaging things. So this astronomer in his work got this idea that uh, I'm gonna apply that to some other human problems. So he took measurements of 5,000 Scottish soldiers and found out interesting things like in the 1840s the average Scottish soldier had a chest size of 39.75 inches if you translate it to non-metric um, and he uh, the, just a couple decades later by the way Kotlet's work inspired Abraham Lincoln and the Union Army when they were facing massive problems with the fact that soldiers uniforms were hand tailored uh, and so they did a similar process and they found out that there was no average man so they came up with the idea of having small, medium, large, extra large uh, and they created a whole new process. This is where we get modern t-shirt sizing from uh, and it allowed them to scale up manufacturing. Cotelet had some really strange beliefs that he developed in the process of his work. Uh, like he believed that the average man was the ideal man and so his goal was to use diet, exercise and things to get everybody to move closer to the average, which is just patently absurd the more you think about it. Um, the bigger flaw in this thinking became really obvious in World War II. Uh, by the time World War II uh, came around, there was uh, uh, air warfare was a big thing and all the planes had been designed and built in the 1920s, a couple decades earlier, and the design process borrowed the Union Army's approach, which was borrowed from Cotelet, which they took all these measurements of their Air Force soldiers and pilots and then used those to determine the distances of, you know, wheels and every instrument and stuff and they made planes and then there were all these crashes happening and they discovered that it was basically because no one person actually met the average. Everybody was an average. So, um, like the oh, this was I was supposed to transition, but anyway. So, the more you average out people, the more you discover that no one person is the average. And this is something that we actually thought about a lot at the beginning and kind of talked about throughout. So, I want to talk about what was our approach. Like, we didn't want to average everything. We didn't want to just throw everything in. Um, so, what do we do? Um, Jen's going to go into more specifics, like the actual process step by step and show visuals. So get excited because that'll be the fun part of the talk. Um, but the first thing we did was just try to establish some design principles. Uh, this helped us define success in a way that was a bit higher level and also something that we could just easily remember throughout so we could be referencing to each other. Uh, and our principles were, above all, we wanted to design something that was simple, modern, focused, and flexible. Simple just meant avoiding unnecessary visual elements, uh, colors, effects, and complexity. Anything we could do to make sure that we weren't doing things that would be not a trend a year or two from now kind of a thing. And so simplicity would help with that. Modern was just taking, taking advantage of modern capabilities that browsers have now and making sure that this theme puts Drupal on a good foot out of the box looking pretty modern. Uh, focused was things like embracing high contrast, saturated color, uh, negative space to draw to the eye to what's most important, and kind of designing defaults to the 80%, um, the sort of 80-20 rule. And flexible was a big one. 
And that was sort of way, a way to find that middle ground is finding ways to provide options for people as, as opposed to designing to an average. Um, we then work to try to figure out what do we do with audience. And like I said, like it's anybody who might install an open source CMS and make a site. Um, so it's tricky to figure out what end audience looks like. So we did some work to try to hone in on like what do we know. And we know that this audience includes beginners, many people who are new to Drupal end up using Bartik, like old timers, maybe use it on something that's like for a little while, but most of the time, like or their own blog or that kind of thing. Um, people with limited resources. People using Bartek are people who do not have a design and development team, usually. Um, and uh, because of this, also, it's often more limited content models. It's people who don't really know how to build out a, a, a complex content model. They just need to stand up a blog or do this thing for their friend's business or whatnot. Um, and that content still can be varied, but where it varies widely is in things like What's the length of their headlines going to be on their posts? What, you know, how many menu items do they want on their site? So we needed to account for that kind of variance more than content model complexity. Uh, and then we worked to define who are our stakeholders. And this was an interesting one as well to me. It was actually one of the first questions I asked, I think, when we were talking about <laughs> like do it, working on this was, who's going to provide feedback? in a design process and when and how and how's that going to work and what kind of feedback are we actually looking for from these people who's going to approve the designs um, so these were interesting challenges to figure out so this was our approach to the stakeholder part of it um, we had a uh, the, we had a real group like that we formed like of actual people uh, pr uh, you could think of this as our proxy group um, the this is a uh, screenshot out of a post that went on to drupal.org, but uh, Dries, uh, Angie Byron, Laura, uh, Lowry Escola, Christina uh, Gabor, the, they functioned as uh, giving us sort of that like core Drupal uh, access, people who really knew the problem space well and who knew what it was going to take for this thing to actually work and get into Drupal core, as well as our team of developers and designers, and we kind of functioned as a proxy stakeholder group to get this off the ground. Um, and then with with that group, and there were others, I, I can, don't know if I can name everybody, Kat Shaw, like I'm trying to think of, there, besides Mike Putra, Kat, Matthew Tift, there was a number of people that volunteered time and worked on this in the early, uh, in the early phase to provide that sort of core stakeholder group. Uh, the goal of that group was, again, to serve as a proxy for the larger community initially. Um, we wanted to basically get to a place through testing and iteration with the, these people to where when we stuck something out in front of the community that we didn't feel like we were wasting everybody's time trying to just give us all the reasons why this can't work. Um, so the next thing we did was we wanted to define the kind of feedback we were looking for from these people. Uh, so by the time we actually put this out in front of the community, we defined specific things, especially things like accessibility, things that people could find that were broken or not going to work from an accessibility passing standpoint. Um, and then once we did a good bit of refining in that process, we actually did a lot of documentation about everything that had gotten us to where we were at that point and then we made basically made the Drupal community our stakeholders and we said here's where we're at in the process here's what's already happened you know help us find bugs help us look for what could be problematic and actually you know I think it functioned very well I was a little surprised how well it functioned because people provided really good feedback the kinds of feedback we were asking for it was helpful and there really wasn't a lot of like woodshedy going nuts over colors that people didn't like or that kind of thing so that was the super high level flyover this is the part to get excited for is the really fun stuff um, Jen's gonna walk you through now what did we actually do in this process so take it away. Yay. So let's talk a little bit uh, about the uh, design process. Um, I'm, I'm going to walk you through a little bit about how we approach the visual exploration for Olivero um, and how we uh, finalize the design system. Um, the big thing that we had to answer, the big question we had to answer was what were we designing? Um, what did the theme have to do and what did we have to account for when we were uh, designing the theme itself? So it was important for us 
to understand the scope and restrictions of the project. Um, things that we could change, things that we couldn't change, things that were nice to have, but we couldn't really include in the first release. Um, and in order, in order for Jared and I to understand how to do this, uh, we had to work really closely with the developers. Um, we also created a list that captured all the components and we reviewed them with the developers to fully understand what we could and couldn't change. Um, and we also captured different ways that the components could appear. And we did this with starting off with Bartik as a base. Um, so what we did is we went into Bartik and we uh, went through, took a bunch of screenshots of all the different components. We threw them all together in a paper doc and then um, we got together as a team and we just started going through uh, each component and figuring out like, what do we have to do to this component to update it? What are the different states that we have to account for for the component? How can the user change the component? Um, these were all important questions for us to answer before we could actually start visualization. Um, once we felt like we were in a good place um, with all the component documentation, um, we felt comfortable enough to start the visual phase. Um, we were working with stakeholders across multiple time zones. They pretty much had super really busy full days. So we had to be pretty uh, aggressive when it came to figuring out um, what we needed to include in the visual research phase. And so what we did is we prioritized kind of the big questions that we needed the stakeholders to answer. Um, and we also tried to figure out a process where we could shorten the amount of time that we took from the stakeholders um, when we had any type of review process um, with them. So. so what should the new theme look like? This was a big question uh, that we needed our stakeholders to help us answer. Um, we didn't have a lot of time on spend on answering this question. So what we did is we went through kind of our tool belt of all the different exercises we could do with the stakeholders. And we ended up coming up with uh, an exercise called the spectrum analysis exercise. Um, and what this exercise is, is it, it basically allowed the stakeholders to complete this on their own time. So we didn't have to jump in into a two hour meeting um, and have them complete the exercise. It was something like, you know, if they had a half hour on a Tuesday, they could go in and complete this exercise. It didn't rely on us walking them through um, anything. So you may be asking yourself, well, what is a spectrum analysis exercise? Um, well, it's a great exercise that our team uses to help figure out what the client is thinking when it comes to the voice and tone, the look and feel of the actual website. And what you do is you create a scale. On one end of the scale is an adjective that could describe the look and feel. And then on the other end is another adjective that usually conflicts with the first adjective. For example, we have up at the top, formal and casual. Um, what the stakeholders do is they then put a point on the scale of where they feel that the new design should more, uh, more lean towards. Um, so what's great about this exercise is that we could conduct this remotely using Envision. Um, and so the stakeholders went in, they put a point on the scale, and then they left a comment. And it's really important that a discussion is open with this because it helps us understand what they were thinking um, when they put the point on the scale. So for example, you know, somebody put a point that was more formal, uh, they left a comment that kind of described why they thought it should feel more formal. And this allowed other stakeholders, designers, developers kind of jump in in that discussion and be like, hey, I agree with this, or you know, yeah, I agree, it should be more formal, but you know, not too formal where it feels like more like a business theme as opposed to like a, uh, uh, a theme that is that includes um, a little bit more than businesses. So, um, based on the spectrum analysis exercise, um, we were able to identify the following keywords that helped kind of guide us along the visual exploration. So we had formal, light and bright, uh, contemporary, professional, approachable, novel, cool familiar and uh, finally high contrast. Now just, just a little note on this too, sometimes what ends up happening is for some reason, and this does happen more often than not, um, points end up in the middle. <laughs> so you're like, okay, so let's talk about, you know, because finding, a, you know, designing a theme that is formal and casual 
Um, it, it's a little bit difficult to do. So that's when you start opening kind of the conversations and trying to figure out, okay, what do you mean by putting this point in the middle? Um, you're able to pull out more details that kind of help guide the visual design a little bit more. So once we had all the adjectives, uh, we combined uh, those with our design principles that Jared had mentioned. Um, and that kind of completed our design documentation phase with our stakeholders. Um, we felt like once we had the design principles and the voice and tone established, we felt comfortable kind of starting exploring the visual approach to design. So our team uses something called Zoomox to explore different approaches when it comes to visual design. And Zoomox is it's not an equivalent, but it's similar to something like style tiles. Um, when you think about it, it's kind of like the precursor to actually starting. The, the visual design. It's where you kind of take a little bit of time and explore different approaches before actually applying them to all the components and then giving that to the client and the client's like, hey, I don't really like that style. <laughs> and then you have to start all over from the very beginning. Um, so Zoomox, our, our team kind of explored this a couple years ago and we found that it works really, really well. And what we do is we basically choose a wireframe and then um, we kind of zoom in on a section of that wireframe. Uh, for example, it'll be like uh, the header with a little bit of the hero uh, area kind of peak, uh, hero area kind of peeking up. And then what we do is we kind of explore um, different styles. Um, some unique, others are kind of variations in styles, but it's all the same section basically. And we create usually like two to four zoom mocks. Uh, presenting those to the client. So design, the client has kind of a variety of different styles that they can look at and be like, oh, you know what, I think this is the one that we want to kind of move forward with. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about Zoom Box, um, there's an article that I wrote that gets a little bit more specific about what they are, how to use them, and how to work with them with the client. So these were the Zoom Box that we came up with Olivero. Um, we had an approach, we experimented with approaches that were a little bit more traditional, like you see on the right hand side, and then we have approaches that were uh, more modern, like you see on the left. Uh, the stakeholder group that we were working with um, tended to uh, like the more modern approach better, so we decided to take that approach and kind of move forward with that with our uh, visual design. Um, the one thing to note too is that our team, when we presented these to uh, the stakeholders, um, we, we made sure that, made it clear that, you know, we weren't looking for a finalized, like, yes, this is the design, um, because what, ended, what would end up happening is we would have ended up being in a longer feedback loop with them, and we didn't really have the time or the resources to enter a visual exploration process with them that would take, you know, weeks, sometimes it could be months. Um, so what we did is, you know, we told them that, yes, you know, this may look like, this may be the style that you want to move forward with, but you know, it, it may change a little bit, it may evolve as we start applying the design to different components and different pages with the idea that, you know, we're, we're gonna come back, we're gonna meet, we're gonna show these, um, and you know, you guys can come back and you know, keep revising. But the idea is like, this is not gonna be a finalized design. And it did, the Zoomock did evolve as we were, um, as we were designing out all the pages. So once we had our Zoom box complete, um, it was time to start thinking about the overall design system. Uh, just a couple of things that I did want to mention before I start getting into the visuals. Um, we got, I get asked this uh, quite a bit. So what tools do you use? <laughs> um, so we use uh, Figma as our main design tool. Um, and Figma is an equivalent to Sketch. The, reason, the main reason why we use Figma is because we're a distributed uh, group. We're working with stakeholders that were all over the world. Um, and Figma allows us to collaborate a little bit better than Sketch does. Um, so we're able to go into a single file and change things on the fly. You could see people changing stuff like, like you can, one designer is actually moving the logo and you can see the logo moving across the screen. It's fantastic. Um, so it was kind of a game changer for us when we moved from Sketch to Figma because we we're able to collaborate in the same file and not worry about overwriting each other's changes. Um, we used Zoom for conference calls, um, especially where we had to like share work. Um, we used Slack for asynchronous communication. Um, we used Dropbox paper for really, really quick notes. 
Um, and then any type of formal documentation, we use Google Docs. And this, this is a doc design documentation that if you were to go to the, um, uh, to the official design documentation, it's all in um, Google, uh, Google uh, Docs. And the reason why is because it allows us to give a little bit more uh, finesse to the, to the actual documentation. It looks a little bit more stylized and finalized. So, and some of the challenges that we had to account for as we were designing the theme, um, the, it was no doubt the number one priority was that it had to be w, uh, WCAG AA um, accessible. Uh, this was not something that, <laughs> that we could negotiate. It was something we came together as a team and we were like, we're doing this. Um, and it was definitely, especially for me, and I, I don't know if I can speak for Jared, but it was a learning experience as a designer that like to have this as a priority, the things that you learn when it comes to accessibility, things that, that you used to do that you can't really do anymore because like it needs to be accessible. And you're like, wait a minute, that's not accessible? Um, so we also had to kind of prioritize um, all our different ideas. Uh, so we had the nice to haves and then we had the must, ha the must haves. Uh, the nice to haves were all the great ideas that kind of got thrown on the cutting room floor, at least for the first release. Um, and the must-haves are like, we cannot release uh, this theme without this being designed. And then the third thing was the audience and the attention. Um, we had a pretty big audience, and uh, there was a lot that they can do with this theme, and we wanted to try and give as many options to them as possible, at least in the uh, first release. So now let's do like the guided tour of the designs and what, what we did. Um, so I did this all in video, so this is gonna be a nice experimentation because um, <laughs> I may not do this next time, but we'll see, we'll see how this works. Um, so I'm gonna start off with the landing page and the article page. Um, and we actually started, this re these were the first two pages that we had designed. Um, and the reason behind it is because uh, the landing page was the out of the box experience. It was a page that would have as little content on it that the user would hopefully see when um, you know they first install Drupal and they activate the theme. Um, and the blog page was the exact opposite. So the blog page has a ton of stuff on it. Um, the idea with the landing page is that we wanted to um, rework and organize content displayed on this page to kind of help users um, get started with using the theme a lot quicker. So that was one of the discussions that we have with the stakeholders, just kind of reworking what users would see once they installed the theme. Um, on the opposite side, um, this was the blog page that we had designed. Um, and the reason why we chose the blog page is because we could test out all different types of components and content and actually try and figure out if this design system was going to work very, very quickly. Um, so we were able to kind of refine the type system, figure out image ratios, uh, quotations, tables, lists, and comments all on the single page, and then we can figure out if it was gonna work or not work, and if it wasn't gonna work, then we, were, uh, we had to refine it. So when it came to the um, header, we added um, <coughs> one level, uh, we added uh, a dropdown that the uh, user can activate out of the box. Um, and this was something that we kind of felt like it was a little bit important because it gave users more control with kind of organizing their IA structure. So when it came to the header, uh, the header had to have a lot of flexibility. Um, I'm gonna start with the search. Uh, we actually got a lot of feedback on the search um, and I'll go into that a little bit further in the presentation. Um, but we wanted, we wanted the search bar to feel for focused and that's why it's kind of dark and impactful, but it also needed to feel like a search bar. Um, the header had to be flexible um, it had to work with default uh, the box experience and with numerous links at different line links. Um, it also had to work with or without a search icon and different states for when a user was signed in or signed out. Um, and one of the ideas that we had is that if the header had too many links in it um, or if they, the links were super long, what it would do is it would collapse into a hamburger nav. Um, and we could actually take that and extend it into uh, uh, mobile patterns which was nice because we figured this out on desktop and we can just take it and send it out to, uh, small, uh, to the other uh, screen widths. Um, 
What was also nice, too, is when it came to the navigation on mobile, um, we were able to take some of the design work that we did on desktop and just kind of extend it into mobile. Um, for, for example, like some of the drop-down uh, designs that we had for desktop, we kind of brought some of those design elements in for, for the mobile experience. <coughs> uh, we also had to figure out how this theme would work on a wide variety of possible uh, logos or text when it came to the branding that the user could upload for their website. Um, and so what we did is we created, um, we created uh, different backgrounds that could appear depending on the type of logo or the type of word mark that the user would use for their website. Um, so what we did is we created darker backgrounds for lighter logos and text. As you can see here, we have with the default um, the blue. Um, but then we also created uh, lighter backgrounds for darker logos and darker text. So we have, this is like a word mark that the user can use, but we also have versions where the user can upload an image um, and it would still work. When it came to the listing page, um, we designed it to increase uh, scannability. Uh, so what we did is we made titles very large and then we made uh, metadata and descriptions uh, kind of secondary. When it came to pagination, um, we kept uh, the actual look and feel still square, um, but what we did is we made the typography bolder to give it an updated feel. Um, we actually followed some of the design patterns from Claro when it came to things like um, to um, arrows and forms. Um, we actually took, <laughs> Claro actually helped us a lot um, because we get, when we started getting into accessibility feedback loop, um, a lot of uh, um, uh, developers or uh, stakeholders would be like, you know what, you should take a look at some of the work that was done on Claro um, and actually uh, take inspiration from that because they, they already were in the feedback loop. They already did the research, um, which was great. So, um, When it came to the editor tabs, um, we just made small updates to the design patterns so it fit with the rest of the design system. Uh, we actually played around with different ways how we could present the editor tabs. Uh, and I'll go over this a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but uh, they were kind of marked out of scope for the first release, so. Forms, oh, this was a fun one. <laughs> um, so with forms, uh, this is where I learned a lot about accessibility. Um, we had to strike a balance between making the forms accessible and making them feel modern. Um, and it took us to find the right contrast that worked within the color palette that we had set up. And this is where we took a lot of cues from Claro, especially when it came to things like focus states and error states. Um, and uh, I just, I mean, I wanna give a big props out to whoever worked on Claro because, or is working on Claro, um, because uh, you know it kind of helped us uh, shorten the feedback loop a little bit. The other thing the theme had to do was support right to left languages. So what we did is we created uh, a quick mock-up for testing just to make sure that there wasn't anything odd happening or any components that we had to rework when we did um, put in uh, right to left languages. Um, another neat thing that we had to figure out too is like, well, what, what would happen to the design if it was on a really wide screen? Um, so what we did is we kind of got a little bit playful here I would create this kind of neat background um, that would appear and has a little Drupal, it has the Drupal logo kind of overlaid uh, back there, so. So some ideas that didn't actually make it. So this is ideas that we had either presented to stakeholders, presented to developers, uh, presented to the accessibility team, um, and they were just like, no, that's not, that's not gonna fly. Um, so the one, uh, this is what the editor, um, the editor tabs, the one on the left um, is a, the approved one that is in the Olivero theme, but we also played around with a darker version of the um, editor tabs. And we got some feedback on the darker version that it was actually too impactful. It kind of took away from, from um, what was actually happening on the page itself. Um, and here are the ideas that we kind of played around with too. Of, well, what if we kind of like completely re reworked the entire experience? Um, so what we did is we have tabs in the lower left 
in the lower right hand side of um, of uh, of where they could be. So it kind of got got it out of the way. Um, the problem with this is that it was it was a big feat to ask for. <laughs> so even though we thought it was a really great idea and like we could help improve that experience um, for at least a phase one release, it just was not doable. Um, sidebars. Uh, so out of the box, um, there is going to be a right sidebar that the user can activate. Um, but eventually, we'd like that sidebar to be flexible and the user could actually move it to the left-hand side if they wanted a left-hand sidebar. Um, so what we did is we experimented with, well, how would content move, have to move around? How would images have to resize um, if users were to take the right sidebar and actually move it to the left-hand side? Uh, the search bar. Um, we actually surprisingly got in a pretty big feedback loop with the search bar. Um, so the one on the left is the approved search bar. The one on the right is our, was our first attempt at a search. Um, and we got some feedback on this from the stakeholders that it actually didn't feel like a search bar. It was too light um, and it didn't actually meet accessibility standards when it came to um, the uh, color contrast ratio. Um, so what we did is we kind of played around with it a little bit. Um, here's another design, some other designs that we came up with, uh, trying to figure out, okay, well, how can we make this feel like a search bar? How can we, make, how can we uh, get this to pass uh, accessibility standards? Um, so users can understand that, oh wait, this is, this is search and this is how it's supposed to work. Um, but we ended up going with the darker version um, because the outlines, the underlying versions, it, didn't, they, it wasn't quite there yet. It wasn't quite as refined. So once we had our um, design system, we had to document that design system. Um, and with design documentation, it's, it's really important to have because when you're working in different files, a lot of times what ends up happening is there's discrepancies between the files. You know, a heading is 10, 10 more pixels to the right in one file than it is in the other file. Um, and this can confuse everybody, um, especially developers who are like, well, I don't know, there's like three different headings here, which one am I supposed to use? Um, so it's good to have that single source of truth that developers can go back to and be like, okay, you know what, this is it, this is the way it's supposed to be, that in that file, that's a mistake. So um, important things to document. Um, we have typography, the grid system, styles, which usually include like color palette and icons and different uh, hover states. Um, we have scale and spacing. Um, and then finally, components and their variations. Um, so our design documentation, um, we documented the grid system. Um, which was uh, really important, at least to get the developers started and off the ground. But what else we did too is we created a style out of our grid system so designers could really, really quickly spin up an artboard and apply that grid system right away. Um, we also documented our type system, color system, um, all the components at all the different breakpoints and all the different various states. Um, and this design documentation is um, accessible in the uh, in uh, Drupal. So if you go to the uh, the issue, um, you can go in and there's links to this design documentation. You can bring it up and go through it and everything. All of this was created in Figma, um, which which is nice because it's you can very easily update the design documentation if you need to. Um, one thing to note too is most of the components that we had documented. Um, we have, we documented for desktop and for narrow screens. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time designing out for tablet screens. Some of the major pages we did, like the blog page, there's a, a tablet design. And the reason why behind this is because tablet design isn't really a fixed design, isn't really a fixed number. Um, we found out that like it could be any number. There's a ton of different ways that com components could break or start like losing their integrity at different screen sizes. So what we do is we rely a lot on our developers to kind of take the initial designs that we have and some of the mobile designs that we did and kind of work out <coughs> the in-betweens. Um, uh, and then if, you know, stuff starts falling apart, they reach out to us like, hey, you know, this, is, this isn't really supposed to look like this. Can you, you know, mock up a design for that? So, and this allowed us to also get designs quicker, uh, get the designs to the developers a lot quicker so they can actually start developing. So 
that is our uh, talk. Um, there is a lot going on right now. Um, so we have Code Sprint that is happening tomorrow um, and Monday. Uh, Mike and Putra are going to help lead that. So if you want to contribute, you want to help out, please go, come and see them. Um, if you just want to learn a little bit more, I mean, we we love talking about this, but you know, we're on a we're on a fixed. <laughs> Unfortunately, we only have 45 minutes. Um, but if you go to drupal.org slash project slash Alivero, that is where you will find everything to get you started in this project. Um, you will also be able to access all the Figma files that I had gone through, uh, gone through today. Um, and you can read up on all the documentation and everything. Um, if you're not exactly sure if you want to help out, you just want to kind of learn a little bit more. Um, we're also in Slack. So if you go to drupal.slack.com and join the D9 dash theme channel, um, you can kind of hang out, ask questions. Um, we have a weekly meeting on Mondays at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, those happen in Slack, so you don't actually have to really join the meeting. You can just kind of hang out and watch what happens in the meeting to kind of figure out, like, hey, this is something that I want to put time towards. Um, so yeah, and we're going to be around for the you know rest of the conference. So you know, please reach out and say hi and you know ask how you can get involved. I think we have about four minutes for questions. Yes. According to that. <laughs> So questions. So came up with a name. <laughs> what? The name. Olivero. Oh, so Olivero was actually um, Rachel. It's after Rachel Olivero, who was uh, a Drupal um, member of the Drupal yeah, community, member, yeah. an advocate for inclusiveness and accessibility, and she's, yeah. a, she's a beloved member who passed away last year. And this theme was named in her honor. And, and I think. Taryn, were you the one that actually, yeah, so Taryn's the one that actually came up with the name, which was awesome, because we were, we were kicking around names, and she was like, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so how easy is it using just the keyboard to get around? Um, well, we're going to have Mike Herschel do that because he is actually uh, in the process of working on the proof of concept and working on the accessibility is that happening? Yeah, so um, we have a proof of concept, which is basically static HTML. It's not getting into Drupal core unless it's very accessible. Like, it's going to be very obvious where the focus states are. It's going to be very easy to navigate around. If we somehow neglected to do that, it would not. Drupal core has very stringent accessibility gates. So we have no choice but to con to comply with that but we want to like it's it's a very high priority it's a, the highest a large priority. percentage of the design iteration was actually on things like focus states yeah. because yes. of being able to navigate by a keyboard and things like yeah. that where it was like i didn't even think about that there could be a yeah. focus state for that item mm -hmm. um and they're actually it's actually still happening mike reached out to me yesterday he's like hey there's some design work we need with focus states i'm going to i'm gonna hunt you and jared down and we're gonna talk about yeah. this so yeah. <laughs> the irony of focus states is they're they're what you don't focus on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For those that don't know, like Rachel Olivero herself was blind. So I would hope we would and she worked yeah. for the National yes. Association of the National yeah. Federation of the Blind. It's a federation yeah. association. Yeah. There were like a lot of really, really, really super helpful documents that. Like, yeah. And, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Is this one going to also live for ten years into the future? The goal that was stated was <laughs> that we. One of the reasons that they wanted to make it modern. Uh, was so that it could maybe feel current for the next five years. And when I said that, I said, like, the reality is it's a, it's a big effort every time this happens. And so it's, I don't think it's safe to assume that, like, in a year from now we're going to be replacing Olivero with whatever, or maybe we should start versioning, versioning it as well. And, you know, but um, I, I would say my gut says it's not going to last for 10 years, hopefully, but it also needs to last for more than one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but they're generally not going to start a new one until the current one starts to do it. Right. Yeah. So when the clock starts ticking, and then yeah. So you had mentioned one of your design principles was to not make the uh, the Swiss Army knife thing, but it looks like some of some of the features would require theme settings. Do y'all have like a philosophy on on how many settings? or like where you're willing to like provide flexibility in that form of a setting? 
We didn't actually establish any specific benchmarks for that. Our conversations that ended up leading to like options, the, so the options approach was a way to provide flexibility without saying, we'll just make it do everything. And as soon as it hits this, then this happens. And like to give the user control. And it mostly came up in things that felt like these are high, like highly common scenarios. Like there's enough sites out there who may have you know, use German language or do something that's going to use really long menu titles that it's like, it's just going to break. And there's probably no good way for us to design a site that looks amazing and shows all those. And if we did, it'd be a whole separate theme for that. Mm -hmm. And so that was, it came in there. I'm trying to think of some of the other like toggle option stuff. Like that the background and the site branding. Yeah. yeah, yeah it was yeah. like flex, flexibility in site branding word name and menu item length and some of those kinds of things were what drove it mm -hmm. um because yeah. those, were, those were like real world problems like we can't tell users like they can only have a name you know six characters long like yeah. <laughs> they'd be like right. half of their business name by the end yeah. of it we had like 19 different toggle options at that point maybe we would have failed yeah. <laughs> thankfully we don't <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Yeah. Are there any thoughts around? Uh, so I I sub themed Bardic and regretted it so hard. It was one of my first <laughs> projects. <laughs> no, like, how am I supposed to know I'm not supposed to? Like, does it say it somewhere? It's like that, that's the thing. Like, everyone's like, why would you do that? But it's like, if you're new, it's like, oh well, this should be amazing code, and I should just be able to sub theme it because that's the Drupal core feature. So, uh, are there any thoughts like if this is something that? should or should not be used um, uh, if you do have a little bit of a budget and you want to do some extra theming like I don't know who's best to answer that but that may be a Mike or a Putra question to some degree the, the answer is no, <laughs> no. <laughs> cool. Just well, then we should also point, it, point that out somewhere, maybe in a, in a readme. Yeah. Would yeah. yeah. you even read the readme? Be honest. <laughs> the, uh, the, the mommy thing does a really good job of like telling you big bright lights. Like, yeah. 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 We, on the front yeah. page, we're we did actually end up talking yeah. about what we could do with the out of the box page, like the default mm -hmm. page, yeah. um, content wise, and yeah. the, it is possible to. We, you could actually have content on that page that says this theme is not meant to be a mm -hmm. base theme or something. It could be a West rule. Yeah. 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 And this theme is not meant to be converted to green, Steve. And I'll just say that on there. This might be more of a question for Mike. Is it going to support the color module? I was about to ask that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the, there's an issue to take the color module out of core. Now, we are uh, in, in kind of a phase two. Uh, we're talking about having like some different maybe color palettes that are also accessible and also a dark mode support. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Are you using, but if you're not a we have SAS, right? And you have like primary color. So we have to support IE 11. Oh, yeah. So all of our variables get compiled down into like normal non-variable CSS. But the design system is created and we did actually think toward <coughs> offering alternate palettes yeah. within our design process. We just, that's kind of a post, post launch. So another my question is, are SAS files going into core then? Uh, no, but we are using post CSS. Thanks to the work that Clara did. Gotcha. Okay. And for what it's worth, the fonts, that was another challenge we didn't oh, yeah. actually oh, yeah. mo note, but we were, you know, we were restricting our font usage to fonts that we could actually deliver with this theme that wouldn't require, it's like, enjoy your new Drupal site, now get an Adobe Typekit account. Yeah. <laughs> like the, so, yeah, the, both, both typefaces are freely available. Yes. Uh, question, well, maybe that is an implementation question. Is the intention to include it in the theme, or that it's referenced from Google? What's that? Oh, the oh. font. No, no, no. We're embedding them in the theme itself just nice. for performance reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they, but, but they have a SIL open font license, 
uh-huh. which are available specifically whitelisted for distribution. Yeah. Drupal.org. Yeah. We restricted our exploration in the early yeah. Zoom mock phase to only things that yeah. had SIL. Well, and the same with like any type of icon design. We did des- uh-huh. we did all the icon design because <laughs> we we're just like thinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and plus we don't want to like feed big tech. <laughs> <laughs> What are you looking at me for? <laughs> 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 Anybody else have any questions? I have a, I think you guys did an amazing job of making it want, like, with your five-ish uh, core features, um, you did a great job with it. So Thanks. Thank oh, you. thank you. Can you make the logo bigger? The theme actually has a theme setting that just provides an optional button. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's just make the logo bigger. And then people going, why isn't it bigger? Cool. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Okay, thanks.